Um, good morning. I'm Leo Liu from Adobe Research. I'll be presenting this paper with John Thompson from Georgia Tech, who interned with us. Um, this work is in collaboration with Mira Doncheva, Alan Wilson, James Delory, Sam Grigg, Bernard Kerr, and John Stasko. Visualization is a popular medium for communication and storytelling. Journalists and graphic editors uh, from companies such as New York Times employ interactive visualizations to engage the audience with data-driven stories. Information designers such as Nicholas Felton produced compelling visualizations for personal annual reports on self-quantification. And designers and artists from design studios such as Accurate create beautiful data-driven graphics, often with a strong emphasis on the visual aesthetic experience. When it comes to the design and production of these visualizations, the designers have many tools at their disposal, but each has its own limitations. Business tools such as Excel and Tableau allow quick generation of charts, and they're relatively easy to learn and use. However, the charts are hard to customize. Programming toolkits such as D3 and processing takes time to learn and are difficult to many designers, but they're highly expressive and powerful. And finally, designers use professional tools such as Adobe Illustrator in their daily jobs, but these tools often have limited support for data encoding, um, making the authoring process tedious and time, uh, error prone. But if you, if you have enough time and patience, you can still uh, create many amazing designs. To address these limitations, uh, we introduced Data Illustrator. It resembles existing vector drawing tools with automatic data encoding support. In designing Data Illustrator, we try to achieve a power and expressivity comparable to the programming toolkits without the need to program. At the same time, we want to improve the learnability and usability of the tools. To give a quick glimpse on how Data Illustrator works, I will, giving, uh, I will be giving a demo by creating a, a triangle bar chart design. The data set contains information on the chances of getting funding on different types of resources, such as books and supplies in different subject areas. So the visualization is a triangle bar chart where the triangles are colored by the type of resources, um, and the height represents the chance of getting funding for that resource in, the, in, in, in that subject area. Um, so we can see, for example, it is much easier to get funding uh, for those resources in the music and art category uh, compared to the special needs category. So here we are in Data Illustrator. Um, we start by using the pen tool to draw a uh, triangle. And next, we repeat the triangle by um, the resource type. There are four resource types in this uh, data set. Now uh, we can interactively change the gap between these triangles. Next, we repeat the collection again uh, by the subject area to create all the triangles we need. So now we are ready to do some data binding. Uh, we select the top anchor point and then by bind the Y position to chance. Using the interactive axis, we can um, align the zero value to the bottom of the triangles. And then we can bind the field color to the type of resource, which automatically creates this color legend for us. And we can do some final touch up um, by changing the stroke width of the triangles and also their opacities. The color legend is also interactive, so we can further customize the colors we use to map to different kinds of resource types. Okay, that's a quick demo. So Data Illustrator is not the first tool that tries to support visualization authoring without programming. Systems such as Lyra and Ivis Designer um, adopt a grammar or template-based approach. Brett, Victor, uh, Brett Victor's drawing tool, Data Driven Guides, and also Data Inc., which was just presented by Hygiene, uh, share many, many very similar ideas with our approach. And we call this approach the lazy data binding approach. Um, the idea is that designers start by doing some sketches or drawings on the canvas first, and then they bind data to the visual properties as needed. The main focus of our research is on expre expressivity. How can we take the lazy data binding approach and scale it to support a wide variety of visualizations? In other words, we want to identify a set of building blocks of visualizations that can describe the structure and generation of diverse visualizations. 
So to answer this question, there have been uh, some prior solutions. Um, in particular, the grammar of graphics is, graphics is a very influential theoretical, for theoretical framework that identifies the building blocks of a visualization. The idea is that starting from data, we go through the building blocks in a pipeline and then builds up a specification that defines a visualization. And finally, this specification is passed to a renderer which generates the final visualization. The grammar of graphics, uh, graphics is the theoret theoretical foundation of powerful toolkits and systems such as ggplot2, Tableau, Vega, and Lyra. However, the grammar of graphics is really a model that describes how computer scientists or programmers think about visualization creation. And it has little in common with how designers work. For example, when designers from Accurate discuss their award-winning uh, visualization, no bells, new, no degrees, they emphasized that the, the, they, get in, they get their inspirations from the elegant aesthetics found in music scores. And with this idea in mind, they sketched and iterated on the design. After they have settled on the final design, it took them about a week to manually encode all the data and produce the final visualization. So given these observations, uh, can we come up with a model that has similar descriptive powers to the grammar of graphics, but better supports designers' workflows? So in particular, instead of st having to start from data, we want the designers to start from drawings and then apply data binding as ne when necessary. Instead of using intermediate ab abstractions such as specifications, we want designers to directly interact with visual items on the canvas. So to develop this model, we had held weekly meetings with three designers over two years. We sampled visualizations from different sources and then asked the designers to describe and demonstrate how they would recreate these examples using the tools of their choice. And based on their feedback and demos, we created about 40 storyboards and uh, mockups uh, illustrating how an authoring tool would work. And from there, we distilled a set of building blocks um, following three principles. First, if we borrow an idea from an ex uh, existing design application, um, the, it must be uh, behave consistently with all the current tools. And secondly, these building blocks should be interpretable so that designers can understand how they work. And finally, they should be composable so that designers can piece them together in different ways to create novel designs. Here is a summary of the uh, important concepts and tools in our framework. Um, there are four high-level categories, graphical primitives, generative operators, structural descriptors, and data binding concepts. Um, next, John will explain these concepts and show how they are uh, realized in the Data il Illustrator framework. Thanks, Leo. So similar to other drawing tools, the graphical primitives in our framework are described by vector shapes. These shapes are open and closed paths defined by a set of anchor points and line segments. We also include text as a primitive in our framework. To explain how data mixes into our framework, we will use a data set from the 2012 Summer Olympic Games. In our framework, shapes such as circles are duplicated with data by a repeat operator. The repeat operator generates multiples of a shape and attaches data to each shape. Shapes can be repeated by row or categorical value, such as country. Repeated shapes are then contained in a collection layout. In the interface, with a circle selected, we select the repeat button. The interface gives us a preview of how the circle will be repeated by each row. Said will repeat by country. The grid layout then allows us to control the number of shapes displayed. We can also adjust the padding to achieve the desired layout for our design. The partition operator divides a shape into constituent parts by data. Similar to the repeat, the partition divides a shape by row or categorical attributes such as country. Each data scope is then attached to the corresponding divided shape. Again, these shapes are arranged in a collection. In the interface, with a large rectangle selected, we select partition. We are given a familiar preview of how this shape will be divided. Again, we'll partition by country. This slices or divides the rectangle. The repeat and partition UI designs follow concepts from familiar design tools that our target users use in, uh, in their previous work. The result of repeat and partition actions are shapes contained in a collection. 
Designers can use collections to lay out the shapes that compose their design. The grid and stack layouts are the current collections supported in the application. Collections can also be nested to create hierarchical structures. Applying repeat and partition actions in varying orders results in desired structure and layout for a design. So here we apply the repeat action on a rectangle, followed by a partition, which creates a stack bars. We can also repeat a triangle, and then a subsequent repeat on that grid collection to achieve a repetitive hierarchy of triangles. Shapes generated by repeat or partition actions are peers of each other. Peers are similar to other application symbols or components that make changes to repetitive design elements easy. In our framework, peer shapes share visual attributes. In the interface, when a peer shape is selected, all its other peers are outlined in blue. Changes to visual properties such as color and size are immediately updated for all peers. Peers can also express different visual properties when lazy data bindings are applied. Lazy data bindings are initialized with the shape's visual properties and the attached data domain for those shapes. We support data bindings for numerical, nominal, and date data types. In the interface, with a peer shape selected, we can bind data to a property such as area. Then choosing the metal count attribute creates a new data binding. Data bindings reduce the manual effort to create visualizations. Here we quickly map fill color to metal type and the height of these rectangles to the metal count to give us a stack bar chart. However, I can still adjust the width of these bars because only the height is bound to data. Data Illustrator gives designers flexibility because lazy data, bind lazy data bindings only act as constraints. Scales and legends act as the interface's control for lazy data bindings. In the interface, we select the color legend to pick new colors. We can also control the output range of a scale by dragging the scale slider. These interactive scales and legends allow designers to get immediate feedback on data mapping expression. Furthermore, scales can be reused or merged with other scales to create a comprehensive design. I'll now use an unemployment data set from the United States to demonstrate a designer's workflow in Data Illustrator. The target design here shows how each state's unemployment rate differs from the national average in five-year intervals. The small multiples for each state are placed in a layout roughly around their geographic position. So now in Data Illustrator with the data set loaded, I'll begin by drawing a rectangle for each state. I then click repeat and choose to repeat by the state attribute. I'll then use the grid to show all 50 states plus DC. Notice how that grid snaps to the total number of states, 51 in this case. Now if I'm not sure what data got bound to each of these rectangles, I can select one and the data table on the bottom shows me that this particular rectangle is bound to Alaska. Now, I want to divide all these rectangles by each year. I can divide each rectangle with the partition operator. Again, I get a preview of how I can partition. I partition by year and in a horizontal direction. But that gives me very small and narrow rectangles. So no worry, with pure shapes, I can adjust the width of one rectangle and all the pure rectangles have the desired width I want. Next, I want to place these states in an approximate geo position. I'll bind the X position, and I'm prompted to break the repeat grid. And I'll confirm this, and then I'll bind the Y position of these states. So that, familiar, or that layout should hopefully look familiar to you. Now, I need to encode the state's unemployment rate for each five-year interval. Let's try binding the fill color, and I'll bind it to the unemployment rate. Data Illustrator gives me direct control of this lazy data binding by allowing me to edit this linear color gradient. Let's make it diverging, feeling kind of patriotic, so let's make it red, white, and blue. And when I'm done editing, I can close it up and it will go back to uneditable form. How does this design look? We can kind of see some trends, but color mapping isn't really the best here. Uh, let's also bind the unemployment rate to the height of these bars. To do this, I direct select the top line segment and bind that segment to the unemployment rate. 
With lazy data bindings, we can make these flexible mappings and adjust them to our exact specifications. Here, I need to make sure the bottom line segment lines up with the zero axis. Now, that looks okay, but the light reds and light blues are hard to see. So I'm gonna go back and edit this color scale, and I'll make it a stepped color scale instead. So now the chart shows red for above and blue for below national average of unemployment rate. Oh, sorry. To complete my design, I'll add some labels for each state and fine tune my design. With Data Illustrator, I've designed this in a matter of minutes. This was just one example. Here is a list of visualizations we created using Data Illustrator. Um, Ben's telling me I'm a little bit out of time, so if you want to um, learn more about the evaluation that we completed with 13 designers, we had them do recreation tasks uh, with a <clears throat> training exercise before. Um, and we've also had um, designers come to us and have been using Data Illustrator. Uh, this designer, for example, has created a visualization that we haven't really thought of. They created a variant of the lollipop chart and they tweeted at us that it would take them hours to do in Adobe Illustrator, but with Data Illustrator, it only takes a few minutes. So as for future work, we plan to make the framework more complete by adding support for polar coordinates and radial layouts and to explore hierarchical network and geographic data. Also, turning visualizations into reusable templates will save designers a lot of time and empower novices. And finally, authoring animation and interaction within Data Illustrator will allow designers to move beyond static visualizations. Uh, thank you. We encourage you to visit our website and try out Data Illustrator for yourself. Is that a question? Hi, uh, David Carger, MIT. That was a, a gorgeous example of sort of putting, throwing together a visualization really rapidly from data. Um, one thing I noticed, though, is that it, it, one of the things that made it possible to do that so quickly was that you had these X and Y coordinates. Yes. Um, and that raises a, a question, because I think sometimes when you're creating a visualization, it's not only about data binding, but also about calculation over the data, right? You, at some point, you needed to get those X and Ys out of latitudes and longitudes by a non-trivial process of rounding and scaling and, and so forth. So have you thought about how to incorporate that kind of calculation that may be necessary into your uh, visualization building pipeline? Uh, yeah, sure. So we've, we've taken the approach where um, we want to help designers in just the visualization authoring process. Um, we've tried to stay away from bringing features into the tool that deal with data cleaning or data processing or generating these values. So we think of, uh, of those tasks as very important to the designer's workflow, um, but better suited for other tools. Um, so yes, I agree. We kind of might have cheated a little bit of that one where we had that part of the data set already created. Well, I, I, I don't care about it as cheating, but I'm just wondering if that reflects something that the illustrator will need to do during the creation. Like, you, yes, you could say it's something that should be done before you start illustrating, but is that going to work with the workflow of the designer, or do they need to have some kind of calculation capabilities during the design process? Yeah, you bring up a good point. I think we'll, we'll have to see when this is out uh, in the real world and designers are using it and the feedback we get from them. Thank you. Hi, great talk, data, uh, technology. I was just wondering how this scale in terms of the data set. Sure. If you have um, a range of <laughs> what you can Yeah, so, so we have some, some and, benchmarks. Oh, yeah, go just ahead. A, uh, and, uh, is it possible with your um, with data illustration to illustrator to use it to clean the data? For instance, many times we can see where you try to illustrate, we see the problems with data and correct them, or it's not available to go back to the data set once it's loaded? Um, I would recommend other tools for okay. data cleaning. Um, and as far as your question about um, the number of data we can support, uh, right now it's around 4,000 to 5,000 data rows. Um, when you bind that and repeat that for 5,000 shapes, that's about the ideal uh, max end. When you get up to 10 and orders of 10,000, it, it starts to definitely slow down. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks again. Cool.